everyone and welcome. I'm NipafX, but you can call me Nikolai, and today it's gonna to be you, me, and Oliver Drotbohm of Spring Fame. Oliver and I recently had an argument on Twitter about the Java module system. But you know how things go on Twitter, everybody's doing their best to stay civil, and it's just not a good place to get really confrontational. So to have a proper screaming match, we met on Twitch and had it out. Unfortunately, we we're quite civil. We discussed Oliver's and my understanding of the term modularity, how the module system fits into this, what it has to offer and where it falls short. It was a really interesting conversation, and instead of cutting it into bits and pieces, I leave you with a full two hours so you can learn as much from Oliver as I did. If you want to skip around, check out the timestamps in the description. If you enjoy these long-form discussions, let me know with a like and a subscribe so we can have more of it. And if you have any questions about Java in general, or specifically the module system, then ask me on Twitter or Twitch, where I'm at NipaFX, links in the description. I stream most Tuesday and Thursday UTC evenings, and write code, have guests over, and generally prod at all things Java. One more thing before we start, I'm really sorry about the sound quality. I screwed up my settings about a minute before we went live, and I didn't notice until afterwards. Usually it sounds way better. Okay, I think we can start. So where was I going with this before I crashed my entire setup? Would I spend like an hour to put together today? Yes. Yeah, so Oliver and I, uh, we had. Uh, so Oliver is, is known. Uh, he will say a few words about himself maybe later. But there's uh, no shit there. There's also his bio there. Uh, so I think he knows a bit or two about Spring uh, since he's been working on that for I think like half a decade at least now, and um, no more actually quite like almost like a decade, right? Anyway, he can tell more you that. Than a decade, yeah. More than a decade even. Wow. Yeah. So he knows a bit. So there was a thing or two about, about Spring, and uh, so on Twitter recently, we were not quite uh, on the same page about the Java module system. And you know, Twitter is just like, on Twitter usually the discussions are balanced and fair, so it's not really a good way to actually get into each other's faces. <laughs> so we thought, we're going to do this now. We're going to get to each other's yeah. faces now, uh, and uh, yeah, so he's here, and uh, yeah, I'm going to give you stage to you to give you like a, maybe a sh short introduction, and then we can start with whatever was going on on Twitter recently. Yeah, um, thanks for having me, Nikolai. Um, yeah, as you said, I've um, been working in the Spring team for, actually for Spring Store slash Pivotal for uh, exactly a decade now. Like March 1st was my 10th my, my my uh, job anniversary, basically. Um, I've been busy with mostly Spring Data in a large part of those 10 years. Um, I handed over the work on that to a phenomenal guy called Mark Paluch in last year, I think May last year. It's almost a year. So, and, and been sort of concentrating on, I'm still working on, on Spring Data, um, helping out um, the, the folks in my team. So I still have some like organizational responsibilities. Uh, officially, I'm a kind of manager. But, you don't want to tell that anyone, right? Because that's kind of so you don't even team. you don't even code, bro. <laughs> well, I do, I do. I'm unfortunately manager as a pivotal uh, code and code quite a lot. But uh, nice. it basically means I need to uh, approve their expense reports and uh, vacation requests. But this is like a new email approved, done, and this is pretty easy. But um, it's been a privilege to like work with these fantastical um, guys. And uh, I still do, but I, with that primary responsibility for Spring Data being uh, in Mark's hands now, I have a bit more time for stuff that I've been working on before already, but rather in, let's say, peripheral uh, time, like surrounding my actual work time, which is uh, basically the, that, that bridge between like architecture and code. So basically, I'm, I'm very interested in how to actually implement architecture, right? You can put stuff on like screens and then PowerPoint or Keynote uh, slides, but when the rubber hits the road and you get in front of your computer and then you have that brilliantly thought out architecture and then how do you actually reflect that in your code and yeah. in the project you have, whether you, I'm not even like thinking about it in terms of like the JVM purely, but that's what we're going to, I guess, discuss in, in the next couple of minutes or hours. Um, but in general, in the first place, and um, then it's basically the, the technical projection, and like what what stuff can can uh, can help you there, right? So is it yeah. 
is it is it that frameworks basically support a certain kind of architectural idea or do they actually get in the way of a certain kind of architectural idea and that's basically the, the space that i'm kind of busy in it touches DED in some places it touches of course also spring framework there's a couple of things we're working on in that area that will actually make it into spring framework itself um mm -hmm. it's not not real not really like opinionated architecture but basically hooks and features that allow you to implement certain things within an architecture uh, in a slightly more explicit way um but yeah that's probably part of or coming up later this year in q3 yeah. or q4 so uh, so you had the um, you, you said that how how a framework can impact an, an application. We have a code base here that we might look at later. Um, just as a mm -hmm. teaser, would you say that is a good reflection of of your ideas of how code base should look and should not be overly impacted maybe by the framework? Um, in general, I think it does. Um, the the challenge with that piece of code, I mean, it's 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 basically a reflection or a, a playground for me to sort of play with uh, certain ideas, certain extensions to Spring Boot that I'm like kind of working on that support like modularity as a key idea. Um, but at the same time, it's I don't think it's it's a like very good example for, or to. It, you, you, you shouldn't actually look at it and try, go ahead and try, okay, I'm trying exactly this and every bit that's in there in my own application. Um, the, because the reason is the following. This is um, the piece of code is some kind of foundational library for um, uh, students at the local university here in Dresden, and they are supposed to implement web applications, Java-based web applications with Spring Boot on top of that. And the, oh, the, okay. code, base, the code base is... Um, constitutes like an e-commerce shopping system. You have orders, you have like um, a catalog, you have an inventory, uh, these kinds of abstractions because like within a semester, we cannot overwhelm them with designing all of this in the first place. But that actually means, um, we, so we're providing that thing as, uh, as a library. It contains a couple of boot extensions so that it's very easy for the students, easy quote unquote for experienced Java developers <laughs> to build something on top of this. They're still like struggling with learning all about the technology, security, what have you. So it's still a challenge for them. But it's all. it also means that that particular piece of code is designed to, um, or it's making certain assumptions about extensibility. It makes certain assumptions about like expressiveness that complicate the picture quite a bit because we need to prepare this thing to be taken by its 500 or 500 students. like. No, 500, 250 students, 50 groups. So very different projects um, sure. that all have to sort of use it in their particular context. And <clears throat> there's some variability built into the code base that sort of increases the complexity a bit to be actually able to satisfy those requirements, but that I wouldn't actually build into, uh, let's say, a code base if I had to build a e-commerce system like, okay. from, from scratch. So if we take a look at that later, then maybe yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You, we can have a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's let's dive in. Let's start. Let's ban both Ooh. of us to the sidelines here because oh, let's focus on the tweet now. Uh, so yeah. we start. So this started with uh, Lucas Eda, which is not so uncommon, by the way, <laughs> who wrote uh, encapsulation is such a good thing. I'm refactoring some of JOQ's, JOQ's internals and I can just statically verify all the usages of that code and be very sure I'm not introducing subtle uh, regressions in my own code or client code. Ignoring serialization and reflection, of course. Um, one thing to note, by the way, so um, who was it? I think it was Zomura, so I already dropped the link to the tweet in chat. And another thing to note here, by the way, is that Lucas Eda made a very interesting decision. Um, so to be able to properly encapsulate JOQ's internals, he realized that if he has several sub packages, well, there's no concept like sub packages, but if he has several packages, then you quickly run into, well, this thing has to be visible in both of them or more of them, but can't be publicly visible. So what do I do? Then I make it public, then maybe I push it to into a package called internal to hide it. And so to forego this entire uh, problem, he has one package <laughs> where he dumps all the classes in and then uses package visibility, which is a like what I call that is, but it's premature 
uh, destruction of your architecture, basically, or your code organization. Because once the JVM does it anyway, let me just do it on my own first. Um, it makes sense that to make that decision, maybe, in that in this context. But I'd prefer if nobody had to make that decision. But anyway, so then Kaspar Nielsen came in. People will complain about Java's module system offering strong encapsulation, but praise it as a powerful feature when it comes to microservices. And this is where we start. Now, Oliver, ask yourself which one, so module system microservices, is used more ubiqui ubiquitously in the wild and why that is. And look, somebody just said something bad about the module system. <laughs> we cannot let that stand. Somebody's wrong with the internet. I had a mission. Oh, of course. <laughs> I, I actually, I didn't, I didn't take any side here. I just like said, okay, <laughs> that, that's, that's your statement, right? But so have you, like, have you actually gone to the bottom of this, right? So what is, um, I, I mean, I guess, I'm not sure whether Casper is in, in the stream, but you definitely see this like later on. Um, so the the, the, the issue that, that triggered my response was that he of, I seems to oppose those two things, which is not necessarily like a good starting point. First, of all, well, a good starting point is it's not a valid starting point, right? You can build microservices and still use JPMS to structure them like yes. internally. That's that's a, that's the thing in the first place. But I think what he actually means is that people seem to be very very. Um, very, very concerned about modularity and think or attempt microservices very, very uh, intensively or passionately these days where nobody actually looks at other ways to uh, implement modularity. And I think this, is, this, is, this in itself is a very, very great and uh, interesting thought. Um, I just like from the experience I have with JPMS, um, I I didn't really feel that, um, or it, I I, I re very often ran into issues with it trying to actually modularize a model monolithic code base with it, and <clears throat> from from the from the amount of applications applications that's uh, we probably get to that uh, in more detail. From applications that I, I, I literally haven't seen any application uh, at all that is modularized using JPMS. Yeah, right. and we spent and, a big part of our discussion for uh, for why that might be, right? So, yeah. um, I mean, by the way, one interesting point that we should come back to later is that you basically said um, one part of of your of your area of interest is how do certain like frameworks sorry uh, don't, don't worry how do certain frameworks impact the decisions you make uh, when, you, when you when you when you create an architecture, when you implement an architecture, and I think this yeah. is also connects to uh, a couple of things that you, that you brought up in this um, in this discussion here. But so my base, my main point is that yes, um, there's there's much much less um, adoption of the model system at the moment. And my basic claim was, and we spent quite some time clarifying that. Uh, I think that's that's not an indicator for anything of the kind of. Uh, well, that, that, that the reason must be that there's no value in that. My my basic my my so I am open to the possibility that the model system provides too little value to be widely adopted and will always be a niche thing. Maybe like OSGI, not harping on OSGI here, but whatever you want to say about it, good or bad, complex or not, whatever you want to say about it, you can kind of think clearly say it doesn't have a huge market share. So yeah. um, and it, it's it's possible that the JPMS will end there as well. I just think that now is not the time to draw the conclusion of, uh, well, nobody adopts it, so it can have a lot of use, I think. And that's what I want my answer, which is, of course, quite snarky. Uh, microservice, because they're 10 years older, am I doing this right? <laughs> was yeah, yeah. Like, that was what I was going for that, because we, we just, like, it's early. Actually, like in the pre-show, we already discussed this, right? Like people like from the outside seem to assume that we're like literally getting on each other's throat with like let's two let's say these two two tweets already whereas like as we already know each other we know how to read these things and nobody really like is aggressively uh, like try or try to be like purposefully snarky right it's rather a funny snarky kind of thing so yeah. um, I, I totally took the irony here the the, the thing I took I took off in Casper's original tweet was that um, 
it, to me, like the, the difference in application in my world, right? It's all like my perception and I'm totally seeing that other people might see other things there. Uh, I see that people like get microservices in production, which makes them feel like that concept works, right? You can you can still argue whether, okay, just because you got your 50 microservices in production once and then have to redeploy all 50 at the same time when you want to ship a new uh, a new version of one, whether that's really like meeting the purpose here, right? Or whether yeah. it's really successful, but they seem to be, um, the idea seems to be implemented and seem to be used quite a bit. While as, as I said, in my world, don't see like similarly ubiquitous deployments of JPMS in applications. I see a lot of like libraries doing significant effort to actually work well in that environment, but I haven't seen any like applications actually using it. And <clears throat> that being the reason why, like let's, if, if we accept that as true, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss whether it actually is that, but if we accept that to be true, then it, it's, it feels like it's just, okay, we see one thing works for us and one thing doesn't. And so it, 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 it didn't come that, that initial perception that he made up, uh, oh, they care about modularity when it's, when it's about like mo microservices, but not if it's about structuring a monolith. Um, that explains that, right? Because one thing seems to work and the other thing seems to be harder using JPMS. That's, I, that's what I sort of read from his or concluded from 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 his yeah I, I didn't actually want to go into the discussion why that is and for, I, I, at least that's not what my original tweet tried to touch or i didn't of course want to make it sound like okay that's just the way it is and uh accept that and it's never going going to go anywhere it's i wasn't trying to um to explain the, 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 that, that phenomenon. Which I think it, it may not come as a shocker to people that we don't sit over each of our tweets for like an hour wondering what's yeah, the best way to put this specific, to uh, this specific topic into 280 characters. Some of them, as I said, might shock you to learn to, learn to know, is which some of them is just write them and send them and like don't read them twice yeah. before yeah, it's out from here, basically. Yeah. And, but oh, and, off by one, off by one, just said because of a tweet from Oliver, he switched from spaces to tabs. Oh, Oliver, both in the tabs camp, like brother, come here. <laughs> Can yes. I, I mean, the, the, I, I, I never really get the question whether whether uh, like spaces or tabs. What there, I, is a, there is a character for logical indentation. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know what? What I tend to say is, I don't use tabs. I use spaces for that. And by the way, I don't use line break either. I just fill up the line with with, with spaces until it, you know until the editor just line breaks. So it gives you a soft wrap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes about I mean, as much sense. On a more serious <laughs> note, I think there there was a, a um, some was a Reddit post or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Someone with like, with with, with, with uh, like readability issues. Uh, co uh, commented that it's the only way to actually get code for for work for him to work. Um, I mean, in the end, I don't care. But it, that's it, it's a, it's kind of a, 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 a classical phenomenon, right? If you post stuff like that, like me saying, "Okay, I don't get the question. It's tabs, right? Period. Done. Discussion over." Uh, and people think I'm I'm kind of like overly enthusiastic about this, and I want to kind of the missionary about this kind of thing. Actually, I don't care at all, right? So it's it's just more of a kind of, yeah. what is it? How do you say that in English? I don't know. You can say in German, um, there are quite a few German viewers as well. Maybe yeah, can drop an explanation. It, it's, it's not really irony, it's kind of this, so... Uh, I don't know, anyway. Yeah, sorry, I but I just, I just found the, the Reddit post. And, yeah. uh, and and pasted it into the chat. So yeah, I read that one too. Like basically, the the the, um, the summary is uh, the person who wrote this. You no, know, has colleagues who have very very different problems with their eyesight, and they basically have to use tabs in in widely different ways. Indentation generally in widely different ways. And so that's the only. Uh, so they have one of them has to have like two spaces, and the other one has to be like I don't know, twelve, sixteen, or eight, maybe even just. So anyway, so and so the gist is use tests for that. But yeah, that's actually a thing that, that I enjoy as well. So I'm enthusiastically, enthusiastically uh, using tabs. 
And if I have the chance and somebody gives me one, I will fight them over it for as long as they want to. But also, if I come to a code base that uses spaces, I'm like, nah, spaces then. Like, I'm not going to fight with like a team of 15 people yeah, right. arguing exactly. over why Tabs is obviously superior. It's just going to, like, even if they just use two spaces, which, by the way, is an abomination that, you know, to, you know, it's a hell spawn indentation of two spaces. But it, like it, it, I can do it. It's okay. So, so when you say you use them in enthusiastically, it doesn't mean you use two taps per indentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's four tap indentation. That's what I use. <laughs> well, what do you use? <laughs> That's that would actually be a nice effect when I go to a large open source project and just replace every every leading space with a tap. <laughs> uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So then the, we went on in the discussion, and so going back to the money system, and I think what we what we spend. I mean, we're not going to go to this tweet by tweet, right? But what yeah. we spend a po large portion of this on is what I think are the reasons. Uh, I'm just going to selflessly put myself into the focus here. Wait, can I? Is there even? Yeah, there it is. Okay. I have to remember to switch back and forth so you can sometimes see me and sometimes see Oliver. Um, but don't don't poke your nose. They can see us both all the time. It's just the question who's larger in the okay. picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so my, my point about this is that, um, like, as, as a library developer, for example, who works against Java 8, uh, you can start modularizing your application, uh, modular, modularizing a library, and, you know, include a module descriptor. But that's a, a bit of work, and it's zero benefit for you, so it's not like that, that too many... Uh, um, too many projects will do that. I know Jane 5, for example, does that, but... It's not like it's not that that's a, that's a very common thing. And then also the problem is, as a library, if your dependencies are not modularized, you can still use the module system, but you refer to your dependencies basically by their jar name. Or not sorry, if they don't have a manifest entry, you basically refer to them by their jar name, and uh, that's a no-no. Like you can't publish a module descriptor which references file names basically. So that means for them they're in a situation of where they don't get a lot of out of it yet because nobody really baselines against 11 yet, right? So if you baseline against 8 as a library developer, it's just a bunch of work. And if you're an application developer and you baseline... So for, there are, I don't know I don't know, no widely used library that says we require Java 11. Is that, is that a thing? Do you know whether that's a thing? I don't know. I never heard of any. No, I don't know. I haven't heard of a mandatory. I mean, some of them support it and... Yeah, sure. And that might, it, might, but they, they still support Java 8. Yeah, using multi-release jars, right? Which is a great way to use newer APIs on older JVM. Oh, no, well, use new APIs on new JVMs and fall back to an existing API on older JVM. So, but like really requiring Java 11. As an application developer, um, you also you have to use Java well 9 or 11 really to make use of the module system. And then for you, as someone who's probably not going to spend like hours and hours and days and days on this, it's really helpful if all of your uh, of your dependencies at least work on Java 9 plus or ideally have been modularized. Because otherwise, for large applications, you get into problems, which, by the way, the, the code base we talked about earlier, uh, they, they also have these problems, that they split packages and stuff. So it's not... Like, it's, it's, it's a tough situation to adopt just on the fly, and I think it's more of a thing like generics, which took, like, a long time to basically make their way through all the libraries and uh, through all the frameworks and through all the code bases until they were eventually, and to eventually adopted. <laughs> Actually, like um, what you just described, even on a on a high level, is like already the first problem I, I sort of have with it, uh, like with JPMS in general. And um, the reason for that is that like from so what you've argued is full of there is Java eight, there's different Java versions, and they support different things. And then there is the module descriptor, and then there is jar names, and there's all these kind of things. So it's a very, very technical view on how you implement modules. Right? So yeah. w whereas the world that I'm coming from and that I sort of see day to day is, and like, and like the, the other aspect you mentioned being like, okay, I can only really make this work if all my dependencies are modularized. Right? Well, it helps the, at least, yeah. In, in the world that I see, nobody really freaking cares about whether Spring or Jackson or anything external is a module. Um, the a module in terms of whatever implementation, right? It, I'm not saying JPMS module. It can be fine, but what 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 architects in the companies that I work with see doing is they want the, want they have a, a kind of 
a, a system to build and they write code for that and they want that to have some kind of modularity, right? So uh, they, they have logical modules, they are driven by their domains. That's going to uh, be very important in the later discussion um, when we talk about um, like sp specific um, aspects of JPMS that sort of get in the way in, in my world, basically, sometimes. Um, and they, they have like domain-driven modules, just like I have in that sample code base in terms of like, um, there is a well thought out dependency graph between those logical modules. Yeah. And they, they, they want to do that to make sure that like, I mean, why do you, why do you, um, why do you try to split up two things in the first place? Why do you want to make two modules instead of one? Because you can, you that split up basically requires you to define a, re, a direction of relationship, right? Because yeah. if it's bidirectional, it's one again, so it's kind of like. And if you have that directional uh, um, dependency or the dependency direction uh, defined, then it basically means that you can change one without breaking the other by definition, right? So it's effectively yeah. it's it's risk control, right? So it's kind of like. The, the, the more fine-grained you actually become with that model system, the more fine-grained you can actually create statements and assumptions about what you can actually, in the worst case, break when you change a piece of code somewhere. So um, that's that's why you do that, and they and people then or teams then try to basically find a way to actually implement these things, right? So these kind of structures, they want, they take these structures, they have them on their PowerPoints. It might even be on different levels of granularity, right? So you have like, uh, when you use the C4 model, for example, of Sun and Brown, then you have the deployment units, and then you basically, um, um, you have like containers in there, different Java packages, what have you, just like I use in that, in that particular project. And they all help you to kind of hide Things are you. It's not. It's not just about organization in, in terms of like where do, do I put stuff in package A or do I put stuff in package B and put stuff, put stuff in package C and keep everything public because then everything can connect to everything still, right? Um, but rather you're trying to kind of compartmentize or encapsulate uh, certain uh, different levels of granularity. And um, the question is whether. A technology that's sort of supposed to help me achieve that, um, and its design and its approach to exactly that topic is kind of is actually helping with that, or rather getting in the way. And I think um, the the that kind of focus on like jars and, and the, the technical implementation is kind of already doing that. Um, let me finish off. With a, on, on a positive note, because I'm kind of like arguing that okay, it might just be a bit more problematic. I think JPMS is completely fine with what it was supposed to do, which is modularizing the JDK. And a lot of the design ideas, I'm 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 not really like lacking. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of features I'm missing in there, but they the features that are present are like you can literally see and feel that they have been built around the idea and the requirement of modularizing the JDK. And they've done that and they've achieved that. And that's a, that's like a, it's, it's a success in the, in, in the first place. Um, however, if you're like working with applications, there are a couple of other requirements coming up. And I, I remember me bringing some of those up when the model system was still in design. And the feedback I got was, um, yeah, it's it's not something that that it's out of scope. It's the uh, the, the feature the request is out of scope, which I th again think is was the right answer back back then. Because um, why would why would you design a J, uh, like a, a, a module system that adds more complexity than needed for the task that you're actually trying to solve, which was modularizing the JDK? If it's not a requirement for modularizing the JDK, then why would we actually build this? Because just because some random dude comes up on the internet, right, and says, "Okay, I want, 
uh, why do we actually need to have a module, a jar per module, right? This is like one thing that was... Yeah, I, think, I think we should, the jar, why is the jar a module? We should discuss that uh, thing maybe first, because that was something basically that it took me a while to understand, but that is, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you made but, such a critique. But before I get that, we're quick about the, yeah, yeah. the goal. You said the goal of the module system was to modularize the JDK. I think that's how it started. I think officially um, that was not... I mean, what you're saying basically is... Um, it was treated as if that was still the goal, but I think officially it wasn't anymore. So that could actually point to a shortcoming in the development process where it's basically... So I, th I get and it also makes sense to limit the, the scope of the entire feature and say, look, we're going to make, have this version one and then, you know, later we can, we can improve on that. But then, I mean, yeah. that's, to hamstrung my, my argument here, as far as I know, module system development ceased with the Java 9 release, and I can understand that Mark Reinhardt and everybody else involved wanted to burn down the entire Jigsaw repo and never talk about it again, so and the mailing list too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I get that, that maybe you have played a role there. But since the, like, there, there, was, there hasn't been a lot of, a lot of uh, change since then, but then also since there's little adoption, there's little actual practical feedback, I would have the same sky in the pie discussions maybe again that we would have had back then. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to play devil's advocate here, even if there was, I mean, I could come up and like bring up the same feature request that um, I brought up like back in the days, right? Um, I'd still argue, why would you need, why would you want to uh, com make this existing thing that's already quite complex in its current arrangement, even more complex, right? For, I mean, that would, that would requ require like more than let's say one uh, one dude just show up on a mailing list asking for um, for a one particular feature or, or anything like that. Yeah. So I, I can totally see that, like as you said, both like they the team worked so hard on it uh, and for a long time and they've been probably very exhausted. But let's be honest, there's been literally no development since like yeah. development in terms of changes to the entire arrangement since the the JDK nine release, which. Yeah. Is kind of um, yeah. It's kind of it's it, which which I don't think again. I don't think it's a problem. It's it's just at odds. The thing I think is kind of weird is that it was even back in the days it was presented as okay. This is the module system for the JVM, and it people I think perceived that as okay. This is the primary the primary thing I'm going to use when I think about modularizing my application. And actually, I, I don't think it is that, and it's actually fine that it is not that. Um, it's just that still people like um, try to explain why there's not not like me for the option. <laughs> um, but, but so it, it's it's or again, I sort of have to justify why don't you let's say use JPMS for that particular project that you that you looked at. Um, yeah. Um, and and. Personally, I mean, I, I, I mean, we can exercise with, with the particular project what would it need to to just e even not not getting to a technical okay is here a particular tiny feature just to make it work in general I have to add or change the project to be much more complex than it actually currently is yeah. and um, I don't necessarily see the the need to do yeah. That. So let's get into the jar thing, but quickly before we do, yeah, um, I want to pick up something from chat. So, uh, first of all, so Kiwi uh, said, um, although I don't, even back then I didn't know what you were referring to, uh, really, uh, Kiwi, you wrote for application level encapsulation. Is this really important? What exactly is, is this? Was it what, what Oliver was talking about back then? Maybe you can give us another exp um, um Another indicator, because you continue, this can be done on an organizational level or enforcing it with Arc unit, uh, Arch unit, so that would be interesting. And while you type out an answer, I want to uh, read something that Zamuras wrote. Mm -hmm. um, JNet Platform, Jupyter and Vintage were drafted on Java 8, but already in modular manner. I just had to inject module for Java files. So basically, like we said, that's all, that's all that needed to be done beyond. Yeah. Um, the case for JNet4 is lost, not only for modules, that library is good as is. Yeah, I think it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think JNet4 is... And that's, that's also the reason I think still why JNet5 doesn't see this, the adoption it deserves, because JNet4 is just really good already. It's not like... I mean, 5 is... I think it's better, w way better actually, but 4 yeah. is so good in so many regards that like I think few people feel the need to actually upgrade. But that's all a different topic. 
Um, let's see. Yeah. Kimi said it was about using modules for encapsulation application development. Yeah, that's my that's basically my argument, right? My argument is. Um, um, so I, as Alib and I already checked a little bit before we started this, and one of the topics that came up is that everybody is, of course, um, impacted by or is yeah, is impacted by the sort of the, the projects they see. And the project that I worked, well, and by the way, I'm sure Oliver saw tons more projects than I did. Uh, the project that I've been working on uh, for quite some time now um, is big. Ish, I don't know where Big really starts. It's a one and a half, although I, now I think it's more like one and eight point eight, maybe million lines of code, and it's split. And Oliver, don't cringe into like four hundred fifty something Maven sub projects, meaning it's like four hundred something jars. And something that I run into a lot is that I mean, there's like over like it's it's, it's, almost, it's twenty years old. Like it's a twenty year Java code base, right? And we're running on Java eleven, so I always make this argument: if we can do it, you can do it. But the point is. Well, problem that we often have is that somebody at some point wrote a module, like right, like a Maven module we're talking now, uh, wrote a piece of code, a uh, large piece, an arrangement of code, and then they realized, oh sorry, then they, they made the decision, well, this is basically the public API, right, what everybody else is supposed to use, and then I still need some crap for implementation. And it happens quite often that at some point something doesn't work well in the application, some refactoring seems hard, some, some feature that should be simple isn't, and then somebody realized, oh wait, yeah, you're using all of that stuff like you shouldn't have. That was meant for a specific use case. And what I really like that happens not well not frequently, it doesn't happen every day, right? But it does happen and always painful. And it happens because the, there's no perfect knowledge in a code base like a code base like this. And what I see here is a lack of statement in code of you can use this. And if you start using this, you're doing something that was not the original intent. So even within a big code base, my argument is strong encapsulation helps communicate in code what the designer of a piece of code meant. Definitely, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And if, if you can achieve that with your current arrangement and everybody is fine with these, four, guess, these 400 modules, there's, there's absolutely no, no issue with anything at all. I, I'd much rather see something like this, like with proper uh, doc, like documented, how do you structure like the, the relationships of 400 modules? And how do you document those? And that's really an interesting question as well. But no, no, the answer um, is very I, simple. I'd much rather see this than uh, a monolith of 200,000, 400, 500,000 lines of code that doesn't have any kind of like proper main, properly maintained structure. So the thing that that's the thing about that we don't we don't there is no documentation for that because it's just like there are like everybody has some kind of layering in their head where they hope that the modules <laughs> behave accordingly, but there's no practical actual like oh you want to do this then look at this diagram and you know where to put it. So it's it's yeah. uh, it's a bit of a garden. It's not it's not it's not a clear architecture. yeah. So then you're kind of I mean uh, I mean there there is a bit of quote unquote documentation in terms of like the dependency declarations, right? So you at least you at least can uh, you you sort of documented you documented the state of the art. So uh, by let's say even if it, if you didn't use JPLS in the first place, but only Maven modules, right? Then you declare dependencies to certain modules. You declare yeah. differences in in runtime and compile scope. You can so there is some kind of uh, structural information about the project. And um, the, the question is whether that is what you envisioned in the first place, right? And uh, whether, how, you, how you actually, um, you know, or whether you sort of, that one module has, a diff, diff, a depends on another one, that it shouldn't actually in the first place. Yeah. But in that, in that kind of arrangement already like, is, is, a, is a very great step in the, in the right direction in the first place, because Maven by definition, this allows like cyclic dependencies, right? Exactly. So you, you, you prevent these kind of, these kind of clusters of, of dependencies, and that's already s something, and it's something I see missing in, the, in a lot of projects in the first place. So it's 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 a good a good place to, to start in the first place. So um, so I, th yeah. I think it, so to, to, to cycle back to the jar thing, which is also I think what what, yeah. what you're thinking about. So I, I got under, I'm under the impression that when you think about modules, you're thinking about something smaller than jars, and so the problem that we right. have with this big project, of course. Is it's 450 modules, that also means which compile it, well, ideally you don't compile all of them, right? But if you have a full clean build, you launch yeah. Maven 
Surefire plugin 450 times and failsafe and compiler plugin and the compiler itself and all that adds up, right? So I was writing a plugin that did some JDEPs thingy about internal dependencies and it just and it took like half a second on a single module. That's great, mm -hmm. but if you multiply half a second by 400, you end up with like two and a, three, almost like three minutes. We run this in parallel, but like total build time increases by three minutes. That, that's, that's a joke. Like you don't want to build, increase your build time by three minutes just, you know, for no reason really. And I think that comes back to what you said, like splitting a project that is that works well within one jar into several jars just so that i can use modules <laughs> it's not that, that i think was your was your was your most was your critique right of the module system right there well i mean it's, it, it adds in terms of uh, if you're using maven i think it's similar for gradle um you like the first thing is you have to basically maintain more metadata right so you, you have additional problems slash build that gradle files um, more stuff that you have to maintain that way. Um, one other aspect I think is uh, you, you phrased it in terms of I, I think I think of a module as something smaller than a jar. I actually what, what I'm thinking is I don't necessarily want to have them have them a module and the physical representation to be a one-to-one -one relationship. Why is the reason for that is that I think that um, as I said, if I if I go from um, from a monolithic code base, let's say we have one jar, we have those five hundred thousand lines of code in there, we have like two, three, four hundred packages, and on the other end of the spectrum we have those four hundred jars with let's say two, three, four packages each, and like twenty, thirty classes for that. Um, it's kind of like. It's it's a very flat structure in in the in the one situ in, the, in the in the very monolithic situation, and it's a completely brittle structure in the in the four hundred modules um, uh, um, scenario. In each of those scenarios, there's no real guidance in terms of like I want to understand a part of the system. What where do I look? Right. So there's because you just have two. You basically have two levels. Right. It's either uh, like very fine grained and or very 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 coarse grained. But what I what I like ideally would like to get as an architect um, is some kind of means to introduce more levels of granularity, so that I can basically say, okay, I have these I have these logical modules, right, and they can consist of let's say that that could actually end up a module could end up as a single jar. It could also end up as a package inside. A jar that encapsulates two or three or four modules, um, so that I don't necessarily also expose my internal structure to the outside world. Because with that 400 jar um, arrangement, I basically have 400 of these jars, uh, snapshot jars, in my Maven repo, and it's not really something that's consumable in the first place, right? Because in the end, you build some kind of Uber jar or anything like that. Um, Later on, it's not something that is kind of, um, let's say, I, I want the, the outside deployment or artifact arrangement be more aligned with consumption, right? With, and that's probably something coming in, in, in an idea or a sentiment coming from the constant struggle within uh, the Spring Framework ecosystem about how granular we actually want to have our, let's say, Spring Framework jobs, right? It's what is it, twenty or something like that? Um, and we have, let's say, in in the the ORM Spring ORM uh, module is a good example. We have support for uh, for different Hibernate versions. We had support for different JPA providers, and there are purists that argue that code shouldn't actually end up in a single jar because we now have to do optional dependencies and then at runtime you, or you have to compose spring orm jar plus hybrid or plus eclipse link or what have you they advocate you would want to have a spring orm eclipse link spring orm hybrid link, if you like really want to get down to this right but if if we do that we end up with spring framework being 200 300 modules and then that being a pain in the ass for application developers that now for every tiny bit they want to actually um, uh, like base their application on, they pick like not as they have to do now. It's, I mean, it's, it's 10 or 15 spring jars usually anyway, but they would have to pick like three times as much, right? And yeah. it complicates that as, uh, assembly 
um, that assembly or that, that, that client usage actually, if you have more fine-grained structures. So yeah. that's why I'm kind of looking for this, this middle ground where I, in the very, I'm not even saying I wanna, I wanna define where that is, I just want to have the freedom to sort of choose the artifact granularity and the module granularity as my project or the requirements in my project actually come up. I might go one way for one project because nobody really cares and I might go with a, with, with a different decision in, in, in a different project, but that prescription of a module, there can only be one module per jar. I found that very, very limiting because that essentially means that whatever module you want to build, even if it that just contains two classes or something, that needs to be an extra jar, which means it needs to be an extra Maven module or something like that. And that kind of like adds need additional POM files, yeah. yada, 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 all these kinds of things. Yeah. So, um, I mean, an, an easy quote unquote thing to solve that would theoretically, I'm, I'm probably missing a, a lot of context and a lot of issues as I usually do with suggestions like that, uh, would be to just like allow multiple module descriptors per jar file. Is that, I mean, you're the expert on JPMS. Do, do you think that like theoretically is, is possible? Yeah, so they're called multi-module jars and they were brought up during the, um, during the, the development, during Project Jigsaw. And mm -hmm. there were, there's a big list. So towards the end of the project, uh, there was a list was created uh, which contains all the, the, the issues that were pushed. And that's one of them. And okay. so, yeah, I th I'm not sure, as, as, we, as we already talked about, there's no development there, so it's not, uh, at least not that we know of. I think we would if there were. Um, so yeah. it doesn't appear to be um, be worked on, but yeah, that's that's the thing that people did bring up. And I get, I get what you're saying, that... Uh, so even now already you say that it's not, it's not a module system just adds to the problem here, right? What you're saying is that it's already a problem that granularity is perceived on the level of jars that for a modular spring framework, I already expect to have, depending on my point of view, one jar, 20 jars or 200 jars. Whereas what you're saying, it would be ideal if the jar is just something that I throw at the customer or throw at the whatever, Docker image, jar, yeah. Java tool, the JVM, whatever, whatever I throw my jars at. Uh, uh, but everything every other architectural concern where it comes to defining modules, that should be somewhere else. By the way, talk about multi-module jars. Uh, that also, as far as I know, all, 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 always only discuss the delivery part. I'm not aware of any idea, any proposal even, to have multiple module info Java files in the same source tree. So really that would just be a delivery mechanism. You still will have, basically, to have, this, have five source trees for five modules. Mm, okay. As Amur has asked, if, would you like? I, I guess I, I can already guess the answer here. But um, imagine you would imagine you would start to uh, to spring. You okay? Somebody tells us you're like here's a million dollars. Do spring six on the Greenfield project. Do everything new. That's yeah. what he wrote. That's just my addition here, right? Yeah. And modules are already out there. Java mod like yeah. the Java platform modules are out there. Would you do anything differently? Would you ever think like, okay, we can align better with the module system, or we can make better use of it, or would you be like, man, we got enough problems to fix already. Let's not let's not do that as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that, that's that's a bit tr a tricky thing to answer for me because I I'm not like working on this core spring framework team. I know just know these discussions because they they come up repeatedly and like we've been through that for the spring data side of things. Um, I don't think at, at the current point that we would do anything differently because it's. It's kind of the thing that, like, whatever direction you move in, like, half of the audience is applauding, and the other half of the audience is going to say, oh, that sucks, right? It's going to yeah. get worse. So it's kind of like we, we found that balance. Um, there are occasionally new spring modules popping up um, left and right. I mean, there might be one in, in the next uh, 5.3 release. Um, there's a couple of ideas that we have. But um, it's... It's kind of like balancing the requirements here, and um, like the 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 build of Spring Framework is pretty complex in the first place because we we ship, for example, we ship support for different Hibernate versions in the Spring ORM project, and then you might ask the question, how do you actually build that? Because you cannot depend on different versions of Hibernate yeah. from a single build. So the trick, quote unquote, is different source trees, like, like different source modules, right? So we basically we just basically just shade different uh, build modules into one. With module, I'm meaning 
maven slash cradle cradle mod. But like, how do my, my, my other question is how do you test that? <laughs> That's even well, like right? in, the, in, the, in the individual modules, like there is a Hibernate four, Hibernate five uh, build module that has the dependency on that particular version. That has the code that just runs the tests, and when everything is properly tested, we just take the class files and bundle oh, them okay. into into a Spring ORM jar because we know. Like an application will only see a particular Java a Hibernate version on the class pass in the first place. So, um, and there's kind of again that's that's a bit of an expression of yeah. Of course, we could ship like five different modules, Spring or M modules, but that wouldn't actually make anything better in terms of we would in terms of like the actual consumption and how easy it is to consume these artifacts. Yeah. Right? Um, so that's that's kind of a trade-off, and that 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 uh, requirement plays a, an important role in the decision what the actual granularity for the jar is. And I don't necessarily that doesn't necessarily align with my logical modules. And if I yeah. want to implement my logical modules with JPMS, they sort of like need to be. Um, one thing so that's kind of like i found this very limiting that phrase it like that and i i think it, it just doesn't isn't a problem um in again uh the context that it was originally designed for yeah. um, so. but so so to um so to cycle back uh, once again to what something yeah to cycle back to circle back probably uh to something you said earlier so now again you have the module system here that proposes a solution to modularity that forces me to make subtle decision about a project setup like creating well i want to use modules now so then i need to create more jars or well not more but mm -hmm. i need to i need to cut my modules as jars and while yeah. to someone like me who didn't think about this before and says it's just natural right usually i think about modularity in the terms of jars already mostly yeah so, so but you're saying like this is shaping this uh this um this is shaping this this perception even more, and now right. people even more think about. I think about modules. I think about jars, where maybe they should think about it a different way. The, it's actually what uh, there was this this other discussion thread that that I basically took um, or um, started with you when you posted that uh, blog post where it was about okay, we need to we need to uh, make sure that our dependencies are up to date, right? Yeah. yeah. I think this the, the discussion went a bit in a. In a like unfortunate route because what I was was trying to refer to again was this kind of that, uh, Oliver, that, that, that we, mindset Oliver? of go ahead. Can we quickly can we quickly catch up the audience on what we're talking about? So um, oh, yeah, we talked about is there ever an application that actually uses the module system? I was like, sure, why yeah, didn't yeah. you ask? Because the one I talked about, we are modularizing that, and we're not doing that because I want them to. I'm a freelancer there; they want yeah. that to. That's why they hired me. Uh, so yeah. it's not. So it was their idea. I think it's yeah, a good yeah. idea, but it was theirs. And um, so uh, we wrote a blog post about that. And one, like step zero in that blog post, is I can I can look it up right now. Um, let me quickly switch so you can see what the hell I'm doing. Uh, so we wrote this blog post here. Modularizing large uh, commercial code base and step zero is getting third-party dependencies in shape and that was uh, Then something that to me seemed like a hundred percent natural, right? You want to use something new You want to make sure that the old stuff you use actually works with the new stuff and uh, Oliver had a different opinion about that and uh, by the way chat. I see your messages I, I I'm scroll locked a little bit upwards. I will read them. I will just we'll discuss them uh, we'll just yeah. take some time. So yeah, you go, Oliver. So what, what did so, you think about that? There were, there were two things. Like one is the like what we already discussed that, that you, in, like in your introductory uh, section you mentioned that I find it weird to um, you, 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 your goal is to achieve modularity of your code base, and the first thing you think about is the third party dependencies. <laughs> That's like totally at odds with like my world, basically, right? I'm, I, I, I can again see like if you're using if JPMS is the topic. You're, you're, that's the kind of subtle thing here um, that sort of rubbed me the wrong way. You, when you say modularizing the JDK, then people intimately familiar with JPMS will read this as turning like your application into JPMS modules. Yeah. When I think about modularizing an application, then I am starting with thinking about what logical business modules I want to have, and in the second step, think about 
like what could be means to actually implement those. Yeah. And that's that's what I meant with it's pretty telling in, in my tweet. It's pretty telling that this um, that um, this or that you, you talk about this in, in like in, in step zero, not meaning oh it's pretty telling in, in a sense of okay it's a bad idea or it's a it's a it's a it's wrong. I, was I thought it reflected rather... badly on the module system. That was your opinion, right? It reflected badly on the well, module system. That that is my step zero. That my step I, zero is not to come up with a great idea or something. Did I did I write? Does it reflect badly? Did I write that? No, no, that, that, no, no, no. I thought okay, I understood that's not, it. That's not, it. It reflects. It reflects that the module system um, leads you to think about stuff in a certain way and leads you to have to deal with. Uh, with certain stuff in the first place, right? And that's I, f I find, found it revealing or telling, as I, as I said, because that kind of to me it sort of puts technology before the actual thing that that that's supposed to happen, right? Because I would have assumed like step zero to be um, okay. We had to find out like what kind of models do we actually want to build. That might have been like something that was your step minus one, right? So you've been already, um, you've you've already done that, and you, you, your modularization efforts are now basically how do we get to JPMS this thing, right? Yeah. But um, I I I found it like it, it transports this kind of thinking in oh, dependencies and jars and, and like third party dependencies and jars and. Um, oh, we can't really start with the effort before our third-party dependencies are in shape. That's something that, that feels totally alien to me because, of course, I can think about like modularity in my code base without like I don't care about Spring, I don't care about like Jackson, what have you, um, because that's not that's not the thing that that sort of or the relationships to those things are usually not the things that cause trouble in terms of. Unmodularity. Is there such a word in English? Like um, um, lack, the, lack of modularity, lack of modularity. The, 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 <laughs> yeah, but the, 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 usually people equate monolith with big ball of mud, right? And yeah. people start to think about modularity because they work with a code base that's not modular or that has become a big ball of mud. But in, even in those code bases, it's usually not the problem that uh, some code that shouldn't depend on Spring depends on Spring. But rather that there's totally no structure in terms of their actual domain within the code. So yeah, and I think I think I have to take that criticism to heart because here's the thing: I've been thinking about the model system and then talking about it and writing about it for a while, uh, for a long time now. So to me, um, some words have become normal to use, uh, yeah. which may not be, um, which may not be the original meaning, right? So what I I do that on a side note usually. I don't I don't stress that enough. Maybe I should start doing that. I do the same thing I think in the book. I also do that during my talks and the courses I give. I always mention at some point I'm not gonna talk about how to split your application into the best way into the best way to create modules based on your specific use case. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that you have some kind of structure there. And I presume that there will be that that, that will be reflected in the jars, which I also notice now might be a may, may a, a, an um, error because that's just how I used to it. And I'm always when I talk about modularizing, I'm really what I'm basically saying is like applying the module system. That's one thing. I think look, you have the structure there, right? You, I, I guess you have jars, may, at least one plus dependencies, maybe a couple plus dependencies. But whatever you have there, we're going to take that and assume it's okay for you for your case right now. And now we're going to take each jar and turn it into a module. And basically, we're just going to erect the walls that the model system offers in between the decisions you already made. Uh, mm -hmm. And to me, that means, like, so for example, in the book, I also described, like, going to, I split the entire introduction, so not the entire introduction, but the entire step of going from 8 to 9 plus module system into migration. And then that's the first step, making your stuff work on Java 9 module system. Sorry, on Java 9, no modules. And then modularization for me was always the shorthand for the second part, which is applying modules to your existing code base. But you're right. Like if you, if it's someone who's not, like who's not thinking modules, module system, Java module system all the time, it feels like oh, that's all I have to do. I just write module yeah. for Java. Yeah. It's like basically it's like the microservice thing again, right? I, I just I, do I, X I, and then I'm modular. Yay! Nikolai said so. Totally. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. And I, 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 I mean, if you like, you, you wrote the book and. You're kind of like in that kind of mindset and in within that language, right? That 
in your in your bubble context to speak in DVD terms. Um, this the same way when we in, in spring talk about a bean or injecting things, right? We mean certain things that might just not to totally be. And I think actually at, at a at a that's an, a nice anecdote actually. When I, I've been at a training once, um, DVD training with Warren Vernon in Berlin, and we talked about like a dependency injection using that, and um, we they, there were two folks that were developing PHP. Um, in, in that in that training because it wasn't like Java related in the first place. And I was talking about dependency injection, right? With my screen background and we were discussing things, how that actually plays into designing a domain and what have you. And at, at some point in, in some break that one of these PHP developers came to me and was wondering like what are you even talking about? Right? Because um, not because he didn't know what dependency injection was, but we were arguing like handing things into a constructor or let, let some container like spring like hand the dependency into a constructor and he was like that's not uh, that's not injection because injection is like putting something into let's say a body in a way that it wasn't naturally designed to receive that right so you, you <laughs> and okay the construct the constructor is the way you hand in dependencies so there's no injection going on so he was kind of like it's just like we're handing dependencies to other components, period, right? So yeah. it's inversion, inversion of control. So he was like, okay, dependency injection is auto-wiring into fields because, right, that requires that needle, yeah. that, that force and what have you. So um, I, have to, I have to say, like, it took me ages to realize that a totally normal and legal form of dependency injection is calling a constructor. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing. We, we, make it a, we make it sound to be like very something special and something you actually need a framework, dependency injection framework for. When it's yeah. actually composition of objects, which is like a, um, a kind of natural thing for like any object-oriented language to to offer, right? So it's mm. it's it's a bit weird. And like discussions get shaped by these by these semantic semantical difference. I think. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Where do we where do we came from for, for this? Yeah. Um, about the what was it? We talked about uh, that. I used the from phrase modularization in a in a very yeah. specific. Yeah, uh, yeah, in a, a I, I, way that, that yeah. might not apply in general. And then when I say modularized applications, say first check Hibernate, then I get yeah. that somebody thinks like, wait, what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's something I, I, I wanted to, to comment on, like what you said before, because you said, uh, let's, let's say we assume we both have done the part where we, like, what, we, we made up our minds about like, what modules we actually want to have. So, and then you, you, you phrased it like, we want to put the walls into the ground, right? And yeah. I'm, I'm, okay, let's do this. But if doing that or trying to do that means I need to do something else beforehand, that's kind of a, I say, weird situation. I mean, why do I have to care about, like, as I said, hibernate or spring the shape or the, the yeah. like whether a jar does, has certain kind of metadata to just put that bloody wall between my module A and module B. Why? That feels like, feels something that, that's kind of, it's more getting in the way than, than, than actually helping. Yeah, I think the problem here is that if you want to build such a walled garden, then what's the outer wall? I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge that the model system had to face, right? Yeah. So in many model systems, it's in or out. And obviously that doesn't work for the, for the uh, Java module system because you know, the, yeah. the JDK is modularized. Your code isn't on Java 9, so it still has to work. So somehow it has to understand, like a module system wants everything to be modules, but that doesn't yeah. work like that. So you have to at some point, and the outer wall at the moment is basically the, the jars, the non-modular jars that you put on your class path, they become yeah. automatic modules and they can read, sorry, on the module path, they can become yeah. automatic modules and they can read the entire rest on the class path, right? So you basically have to, if you have a dependency tree with your application on top, then there mm -hmm. is this layer in between where you're, for, like, assuming all your dependencies are non-modularized, right? Yeah. Sorry, I'm not Java modules is what I meant to say. Uh, <laughs> so your first okay. level there, uh, you, like, let's say you have all the modules, you have all the walls you want to have and all your dependencies are in modules, then what you would have to do is to put the first level of those, uh, your immediate dependencies, you put them, even though they're normal jars, on the module path, they get turned into automatic modules, and then you depend on them explicitly, right? So your dependencies yeah. are all, all nicely shaped. Like you basically, you still have to, like all, all proper modules have to list all of the dependencies. And yeah. these unproper modules, they can then rely 
on whatever is on the class path. And I, I, I'm not sure whether that's the best solution to solve that problem, but it's, yeah. it's a tough problem to solve, though. What, how do you offer people a way to start using yeah. a system yeah. where, when they, if they would have to wait for, like, as I said earlier, it helps if everything is modularized, but you don't have to literally have to wait for that. You can try before. If you couldn't, like, if you actually literally had to wait for everything to be modular because before you can even start, that would make this centuries instead of decades. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of interesting because I think um, there's this German phrase called the Weiss die Katze in den Schwanz. Is that the cat's going after its own tail or something like that? Yes, I think so. Um, like yeah. Not sure that exists in English, but what I find interesting about that is that if, if JPMS didn't insist on every module being a jar, then you could start like, or the co a consequence of it doing so yeah. is that like the there is no you cannot really differentiate between code like your own code jar and let's say a spring framework jar right something that's external if there was some kind of some kind of like grouping or anything like that where you can basically say I don't care about like these or I only care about, let's say, this package space, right? So that, that namespace, or any kind of any kind of means that I can d d distinguish the outer world, third-party dependencies from. This is the place where I want to like yeah. maintain constraints, yeah. so that I might have to that I that I'm able to let's say, I am module A, and I want to describe that I'm explicitly allowed to depend on module B, which is also in my realm, basically. Yeah. But that not preventing my code to actually refer to a Spring Framework annotation without me having to always, like for every bloody module, write down requires all Spring Framework core. Yeah. I think realm um, maybe is a good is a good term there, right? To do to, to be nice yeah. to have a realm, so I can say this is my yeah. code. I will do this here. I don't care about the other one. I yeah. want to pick up a couple a uh, couple of questions or yeah, comments right. from um, from the chat. So. Uh, Frizzle wrote, I think Kotlin's internal visibility, and you wrote that way back, I'm aware of that. Uh, <laughs> um, so you wrote, I think Kotlin's internal visibility is a great solution without the overhead of the module system. Too bad they decided to drop package visibility. I mean, yeah, um, a new keyword would be kind of nice as well. Uh, so I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it should have been a new keyword. I'm just saying like like I get that I get that uh, how, how that idea is nice. Uh, the problem is a little bit that public is the default, and you wouldn't want to be to mean public would supposed to mean public. And if you introduce internal now in Java, then nobody uses it, and then it's like then it's a backwards yeah. battle basically to get everybody to use that new word. Yeah. Um, who? How do I start with that? Um, <laughs> Let me let me like start it the other way around because I, there's a couple of like aspects of JPMS that I think I can touch on that I found like again being slightly at odds with what I usually do. Um, I've been uh, and then also touch on on the Kotlin and package scope being the, the primary thing that I'm concerned with uh, in the, when moving to the Kotlin world, Kotlin world because that actually is basically falling flat in in in, in that world. Um, I've been traveling conferences with a tour. I think I have a blog post even on like in a, that I wrote ages ago, where I was kind of arguing that it's not a bad idea to start with um, quote unquote module packages. So um, back in the days, of course, way before J JDK nine, I was kind of suggesting that you have let's say your application, like you have a top level package for your application, and immediately underneath that you would. Uh, introduce like your top level module packages, and that's basically the the um, uh, the structure I follow in the um, in that particular sample project. I think we have to yeah. put some if we have show notes or anything like that, then we have to put the link to that there. So you have all the top level modules um, in that package, and if that's enough for you, you can actually use that package scope, the Java package scope. Um, to hide things from the outside world and only open up things to the outside world that, that you want to expose, right? So you, you already get a very natural, I mean, it's baked into the language, it's 
the default thing is to hide things. That's I, I, something I, I find very interesting as well, right? If we create a new class these days in our IDEs, what what's their visibility by default? It's public, right? Yeah. If we create we create a new field in that class, it's what visibility does it have by default? Don't say public. Pro <laughs> I mean, most of the, the IDEs usually generate them like private or you, like muscle memory, right? It's not really yeah, it's private, something yeah. that the IDE enforces. But so, so why is that? Why do we actually start with public classes in the first place? Um, yeah, I try, I try to start with package visible, actually. Yeah, I mean, me too. But that's, that's something that I, that I came to an explicit or some realization at some point. And since then, I deliberately do that. I, I kind of, it's, it's, I can see that for library developers, and I like judging from the experience we have with Spring Data, it's much harder to actually do that because, um, like with multiple packages, you might need to have types be public that might be might might need to be visible to like let's say other peer packages, but not necessarily be used by 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 developers actually, by, like, or actual customers. Developers. But what is this about peer? Just saying. Yeah, um, the model system helps here. Just saying. <laughs> I, I know, I know, but uh, let, let me get. I, I'm yeah, sure. Back to that in a second. And so with that, you can like very naturally um, like create that like that first level of abstraction encapsulate. Like no, it's it's actually a second level of of encapsulation, right? You can you can um, you have classes with private fields. Um, so you have like methods, private methods. So that's kind of a, a, a means to. Um, have two levels, public API and hidden uh, stuff, like protected, what have you. Then you have the same thing on a package level, and that already gets you quite far because we, you can hide internal structure, again, um, from, uh, from the outside world, from other packages. And then you actually have JAR files and modules that sort of create a new uh, level, not necessarily in terms of access visibility, like controlled by the Java runtime, but in terms of like consumption visibility, that's the discussion we already had, right? In terms of like how many jars do I have to pull together to get something reasonably working? And yeah. for example, for that for that sample project, that sales point thing, um, there are like fifteen mo logical modules in there. Um, that thing is always, by definition, consumed in one. Right, so there's no 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 application in the world exists that only consumes like two or three of the, the 15 modules. They always consume by one. So I optimize the artifact granularity for exactly that for the consumption, and then still have my packages and package scope and public scope to control what's visible um, yeah. to other to other um, um, to other uh, other packages or other modules, for example. Yeah. So the the issue I now let's say okay that's fine you can you can still do that if you want to use if you use JPNS right so you, ideally in my imagined world I now argue and go ahead and say okay JPNS is just another level of control right in between those right in the shape when I shape the artifact I um, I can I can actually use JPNS means a module descriptor to actually add more information and just in the middle uh, add a new layer of, of abstraction. Unfortunately, I can't. Like, my, one of the reasons being, I need to explode my 50 module single jar file into 15 jar files in the first place. And there is also an effect that's often that's a subtle one and an often overseen one in the way that JPMS kind of works in terms of package design. Um, as I said, the the thing that I imagine is that you start from like a domain point of view. Uh, in that project, we have a catalog, we have the order, which can refer to the catalog, and we have an inventory that refers to the order and the catalog. So there's this kind of like structure there. Um, and JPMS dealing with very technical concerns, technical concerns like reflective access, and its primary means of control being packages, creates, creates an incredible amount of incentive to to shape packages around these technical concerns. So yes. yeah. when I when I when I it, it, there's, it's literally argued that like or it's perceived as put all classes that need some kind of reflection 
into a pack, like if you want to, to have them. It, 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 you, uh, let me start that sentence again. Sorry. If you if you want to def uh, constrain reflective access, all the types that need to be um, accessible via reflection need to be in dedicated packages, right? So, or if I open up a package for reflection, all classes in there are available for reflection. Yeah. So if, now look at like, that, that that sample code base basically consists of uh, packages that uh, or classes that are dealt with by Hibernate. Or by Spring Framework. There's not not much else. A couple of value objects, maybe. But that basically means that I literally, it, with that package arrangement, I literally have to open up all the packages to reflection, which then kind of defeats the purpose because I cannot really. Um, there's there's no 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 real point anymore, right? And if I now went ahead and restructured the packages to put all the classes, let's say. I put all the hibernate types or the, the, the domain classes into a separate package and all the spring types into a separate package, then I might need to make types public just so that they can see each other from different packages that I could have, in my current arrangement, just hidden inside the very package. Right? And yeah. it's, not, it's, it's not that JPNS requires me to make them public, but the, that kind of incentive to to have that access control around packages um, then results in a package arrangement that needs me to make more types public than I actually want to, to actually make public. Yeah. I think that's so, kind of, yeah, go ahead. So on this specific case, as by the way, I opened it up right now because we kept talking about it. So um, yeah. I also realized that it's not yet fully important to my IDE, which is, which is a shame. So I can't actually write any code. But ever, anyway, um, oh, you look, there's an unused import. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it shouldn't, shouldn't actually. Um, and I don't know. Maybe it's because of the of the many compilers I have down here. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. So what you said, like exactly. Except services aside, it's only packages, right? That's all the model system cares about within a jar. You open packages, yeah. you export yeah. packages, yeah. and exactly what you said is you described earlier the case that you have a JDK. Uh, no, sorry, that you have a Spring. Uh, spring packages there were some classes are public that are not meant for public consumption and now what the java model system would propose is well apparently package visibility doesn't work for you because well then you would already be using it uh, if you need it to be public then it needs to be moved over there in that other package that you're not exporting so the yeah. package that you are already that probably that does contain your public api cannot be polluted with public types that are not supposed to be public API, right? So that's a basic argument in your, in, your, in your favor where you say, I like that package structure. Now I have to move stuff out to hide it from being yeah. exported. About opening, I think I would be much more lenient when it comes to opening packages though, because um, like, assume your coworkers are not total dicks, they will most likely not use reflection to break into your code <laughs> to use stuff that you want to hide from them. That's most likely just frameworks doing that. Right. So it's not really like hybrid is going to read the other classes that are in there. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. think for opening it's less, it's less, it's, it's less strict. Like with export, I 100% agree. Like if you export something, Mm -hmm. and it's a public type in that package, to me that means I can use it. Like you cannot have public types in an export package and be like, oh no, but you cannot use these. Uh, so yeah. I agree that like with exports you have to be strict and you basically have to shape your code base to that requirement. I, as I said, I would disagree about the opening packages. I think it's fine to have a package being open, I mean, even then, though Hibernate then, just uses a single class from that. Then, then let me extend the question. I mean, why do I ex just have to express it? Could there be a flip switch that basically just says, okay, uh, I don't care about this reflection thing. Yes, or is you have it, open, is it, yes, yes, you have open modules. You can just have the module open. And then like, okay. it's free, okay. it's, it's a reflection bonanza. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then it's, I, I mean, I agree with you that there's probably technical solutions to like, the problem I'm describing. What I'm kind of, again, coming back to is that um, it, it might just be that, that psychological thing of, okay, uh, I see that I to use reflection, I need to open the package that kind of leading to the behavior of uh, people creating packages and putting all the classes they think should use, especially that with that opens directly where you, where you can be explicit about who's actually going to use it. If I say open package yada yada to hibernate, open package yada yada to spring, that kind of creating the incentive to, oh, I put all my spring classes into one package and yeah. my, my hibernate classes onto, into other packages, and that leading to the fact that I 
kind of lose the benefit I would get from much more fundamental um, Java um, uh, language constructs like a package scope, right? That that can be that can be incredibly yeah. helpful. But uh, it, it it might just be that there's, there's still a what is it? Why is it fading? Yeah, I just wonder if any. Uh, so love H13 fade with oh yeah, mate. Did you, you need the Java 11 to compile it. I'm using var extensively in there. I have detected JDKs. It's not allowed in the allowed range 13. Do you use 13? No. Uh, let, I mean, you, you can tweak it. I think I just I I bought maybe, it once. Oh no, but maybe I did though. Maybe I changed the pom. <laughs> um, maybe. Where is the no, it, version? It should definitely it should definitely work with it should also build fine. I mean it's it, it's CI tested, so it's kind of So it says thirteen here, so it wouldn't build with eleven. Okay, things are happening. Um uh, why why do I why thirteen? Uh, let me think about it. Okay. The test errors. Never mind, I just Ooh. want to build it once. No, it's just yeah, for yeah, dependencies, yeah. right? That's all that's the only reason I did this because I I know why it didn't work in the first place, yeah, but I should yeah. now. Um, um, yeah, let's let's go back to something else that uh, because we're still yeah. about the we're back to the topic of encapsulation and uh, there were two more comments on that. So God Warrior yeah. wrote a very simple chain. Um, but the God Warrior is 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 is, 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 is physical name. Uh, sorry, it's physical name. It's real name is John. He works on uh, at Oracle on the JDK. Right? Clients depending mm -hmm. on internals, implication hard or impossible to foresee breaking changes. Implication things break. Implication slows down adoption of newer versions. Ad uh, um, implication less feedback on in development features. I think, yeah, I've written from someone who, do, who do maintains the JDK. I have heard every, like whoever, well, okay, so I don't think that's the reason that nobody says anything bad about the JDK, about the model system from Oracle. But then also, if you are working at Oracle, you're probably not running around and be like, oh my god, the model system is shit. So, okay, I don't think that's the reason why I don't say anything negative about it, but even they would think. I'm just prefacing this yeah. because there's an obvious counter argument to be made to what I was saying is I hear from everybody who works on the JDK that they really enjoy that the model system is there putting these boundaries in place. I can totally understand that and it's I, I, I totally don't doubt that and that, uh, there was yeah. uh, like a comment one from, from Dalibor uh, uh, in our, our discussion I think at some point um, say so, okay you, we prevent a whole uh, like category of errors for, by just having it and I don't, don't disagree with that at all. Yeah. Um, I think Kiviev wrote, uh, so Nikolai, back then when I was talked about, I want to have uh, that in my own code base, the, the visibility, so by, sorry, the accessibility, like not exporting. So and he wrote, I'm talking about using the module system as a technical tool to enforce structure or control over the code base. Mm -hmm. um, but we can ask the question, why did the devs lose control over the code base in the first place? And can technical features even help with this? My point is, what, basically what Oliver just said, you have, you have tools on the basis of classes, like private or not. You have them on the basis of packages, like public or not, basically. And then now we also have something on the level of jars, which is exported or not. And I posit at some point when everybody uses the module system, if everybody uses the module system, um, then this will be, become second nature. And asking like, but what does it buy me would be like asking what does private buy me it, it's just mm -hmm. it's just a tool that we'll use a lot because just as we was private to box something into a class we will now use non-exported to box something into a um into a jar and when i get oliver's point about like giving weird or wrong incentives maybe i would say um that that not saying I don't need i don't need not exported classes to me sounds very akin to i don't need private fields because both of them just give you a tool to box something in at a certain level. Yeah, um, I, th I think there is. Um, uh, I, I think there's one of the uh, great Simon Brown articles, or blog articles, where he goes into. Um, and he's talking about packages, and we've been sort of in line with our like train of thoughts for this kind of uh, these kinds of arrangements for for quite quite a few years already. He's talking about packages, but I think the case can can easily be made for for jars as well. Um, if you only use packages for, or most people I see, most teams use packages for um, for organization. So they um, like in the worst case, they put all services in one package. They put all. Uh, repositories in one package, all ex exceptions, so yeah. that they use it for technical grouping, yeah. and not at all using it to implement encapsulation, right? And until uh, JPMS, 
jars were basically the same thing, right? You were grouping stuff and you didn't have, there was no one, I mean, except the OSGI world, no one was really uh, trying to make them use it as a means of encapsulation in the first place. And JPMS actually does that. And I, I think that's, that's a, a good thing to do in the first place. So you want to have these different kind of levels of granularity that sort of distinguish between the public part and the implementation part. Actually, just as you said, in the class you have that, in the package you have that. If you like, let's say JPMS as kind of I, if, if you remove the things that kind of get into my way at least, uh, is does that on the jar level, right? And it's kind of, it, it helps you to just like build, break down a, uh, um, a very, very uh, a bigger system into manageable parts. Because as we started, like, uh, just imagine a single package with 400 classes in it, no structure at all. I mean, for one, it's hard to actually get a grasp of what's actually going on, right? Where do I look to find out about, yeah. uh, let's say, even in Spring Data, there's this correct parsing and there's configuration and there's Spring integration. Um, like, um, just being able to find where to look in the first place. Yeah. And the other, the other issue being, if I don't have these different levels of granularity and imp impose some control over them, how do I actually uh, find out about like structural violations that I introduce by accident? Right. Yeah, you cannot like um, no way do you have like I think depending uh, except uh, sorry understanding a dependency tree on the level of packages like that package depends on that package that's somewhat reasonable but understanding that like here are three hundred classes <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Go it's, figure it's it out. totally totally impossible right and that's that's even even if you let's say um, um, if you if you like and it, it, it that the same is true for four hundred job files right it's kind yeah. of like it's it's a, it's a it's a it's the same thing so. Whatever on every every level granularity, I think everyone does it so, him or herself a favor to actually make the number of things that you have to oversee somewhat manageable. Right? You wouldn't want to look into a package with 400 classes. You wouldn't want to look at 400 jar files to get a grasp of what's going on. Yeah. So, um, so there was there was well, there was one final thing um, I had, and we I actually have a nice example I think in the code base for where I think JPMS is, is a bit at odds or imposes a bit of a restriction. Do you think we we, could, we should? Could let's let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at that later. I wanna um, okay, go ahead. maybe I should at some point get rid of these damn errors here. Um, but that's a different thing. I want to um, what you just said about the package structure about putting exceptions yeah. and services. Um, I never cared too much about. I never thought too much about that. But I watched the talk by Uncle Bob Martin, which I don't hold in particularly high esteem anymore. Um, but the talk was really. Uh, I had a uh, that, different story. That talk, yeah, was really. I, well, also the the technical the. What he thinks about comments <laughs> and how he writes about comments, is, yeah. so I also have technical issues with him. But anyway, so but that 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 thing that he talked, the talk that he gave, that was the first time I heard this, where he said, like, look, um, if I give you or some somebody who's reasonably familiar with architecture, like of buildings, right? If I give you a ground plan of a church, you will see it's a church. If I give you a ground plan of an airport, you will see it's an airport. If I give you a ground plan of a hospital, you will see it's a hospital, right? If you're an architect and I give you, you don't even have to be a particularly experienced one, probably even like noobs like me could figure it out half the time. If I give you a ground plan, you probably can figure out what this thing is for. And he says like if you open the top level packages on a random application, the best thing you can hope for is that you can judge what framework it uses. And yeah, that's yeah. all. Like it's like particularly also in the Ruby world, I think where it's like... Um, what which one was it? Rails, which promoted the model view controller as top level packages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sandro Mancuso, I think, also um, went further, like, to talked about this idea. And these, the, these two folks, I like, got this idea the first time, like, actually, no. Like, the top level packages should tell you, like, maybe the top level is like domain logic and spring or whatever. Like, okay, so I'm, I'm willing to go one level deeper. But at some point, you should have a package that you open, just like the one that you have here, where basically it tells you, like, look, you have time and user account and support and quantity and payment and order. So this looks like accountancy. I mean, come on. Like, so you look at this and you get the feeling of what is going on in here. Yeah. And uh, that's the, I think that's really valuable. And, and I think that, that kind of there, there is a lot of the value comes from that um, apps 
attraction level being the right thing, right? Or like aligned, the attraction level being aligned. I think there is um, there is even one like I'm not sure whether it's Bob, uh, Bob Martin, um, yeah, one of the, the principles. Um, is it in the solar principles? I'm not sure. That actually says, or is it just clean code? I don't know. Um, that basically says that even within a class, you want to expose API that's like working on the same level of abstraction, right? That you're not working with a customer number and a byte array in the yes. same yeah, method. Exactly. Right? And that's kind of the, the idea that I sort of had here. Like for these, what is it? I mean, there's. Like, Sorry, I just went out of presentation mode to fix this. I like I'm, so this worked for earlier at some point. So it's ahead. not the problem of uh, of Oliver's project just because everything is. It builds fine from it builds on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, something was not set up here. Uh, so yeah, I'm yeah. just gonna gonna preface that. So if you see all this yeah, red yeah. here, that's most likely well, not so most likely. That's my fault. Period. Okay, so oh, let's look into this. Um, then yeah. let's let's dive a bit deeper. Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, there are, of course, like technical packages, like the core one and the support one basically contains uh, framework integration and, and some Spring extension. That's, that's not the thing. But like from the, from the business terms, you can sort of discover, right? It's kind of becoming clear that, okay, we, we have a catalog, we deal with an accountancy, and there's actually no real structure underneath it. I mean, I could have, uh, again, yeah, that's I, see people, I, I, I can see people like package structure underneath it. I see people using a repository, service, and what have you package, but uh, which sort of helps them navigate and again organize code, but it's completely at odds with the idea of encapsulating stuff, right? Because with, with let's say, take the accountancy, for example, there's the public interface accountancy that has like business operations on it, but its implementation is already packaged private. Um, that the persistence, persistent accountancy works with an accountancy entry repository. We, we don't have to discuss it, the, the domain details. Yeah, but, but, the also, on the same but, also that, but also that is package protected. So to the outside world, it yeah. doesn't even matter whether we're working with a repository underneath it. We, we encapsulate like the internal structure. And especially the layering is something that, like, I mean, come on, which, which semester in computer science do you have like layered architecture? Like, a service or UI service repository. That's not something I have to scream all over my, my package structure because, like, we all know it. Right? I mean, no. like, what helps navigating the code base is um, the uh, is basically the, the domain structure, and that's that's what changes from application to application. I do kind of the same trick that that Bob does in my in, in the lectures I give at the at the TU, where I, I start this kind of like I, I put just like three three lines um, on the on the on the drawing board basically, and say okay who had or like not not in not in the lectures actually in, in presentations I give like who in the audience has an architecture like that. And then literally everyone goes up and I'm saying, okay, are you all working in the same project? No, you're not, right? So it's not <laughs> that kind of thing. That kind of distinction is, is not a particular helpful one to actually yeah. help me understand what you're working on, right? You're yeah. doing an AR architecture. Yes, yeah, so what? Um, uh, so that that's kind of like, uh, that's the reason I, 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 I try to kind of avoid these layer packages in the first place because they, they, I mean, they, they help you kind of like, or like, let's say rather inexperienced developers to find themselves away from the code base. But uh, on the other hand, they have a negative side effect on um, like having, let's say I had a repository package here, right? That I have to actually make accountancy entry repository public so that it's visible from the persistent accountancy implementation. Uh, for the for the persistent accountancy implementation, which then has the negative side effect that every other other piece of code in the very code base could just go ahead and auto wire accountancy entry repository into their into their code, right? yeah. so into into another service. And I want to prevent that. That's that 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 thing should be non-existent to anyone else. And I can actually make. I don't need complex tools to enforce that. My bloody compiler will do it for me. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, and I, I'm I'm a big fan of using the most simple solution to a problem at hand, right? Um, yeah, but we all know that that's a multi what's called multi-dimensional optimization. Simple, like what what kind of simple you want. But I get well, what you're saying, right? In, in this case, if, if if the compiler can catch an architectural yes. violation, 
please do it for me, right? Yeah, so that's, that's kind true. of the thing I'm sort of trying to optimize for. I mean, what you said here about the, about the folders, the, sorry, yeah, I already made my point here, basically. Uh, I spilled my, yeah. spilled the, uh, the milk, is that what you say? Oh, by the way, my milk is, my, my milk is empty, shit. Yeah, uh, I brought coke and it's empty too, so we sort of have to. <laughs> Dial this down a bit, like at some point. <laughs> yeah. So what I was what I was trying to say is, and uh, that also relates to some of the chat message or one chat message because I scrolled all yeah. the way down. Um, so what you said, like some people have um, additional packages here, and I did the same thing to have something granular because it, at first it felt weird to me exactly what I just described. Why do I have like something that deals with Hibernate and something uh, uh, stuff like? Well, that's actually not even Hibernate, I guess. That's more like Spring, right? Uh, yeah. why, why, why would I have that in the same package? It feels, felt odd to me as well, so I started having sub-packages here, but then there's, there's a collision here between what we think and what the JVM think, because we represent packages as folders, and I think I saw on your machine that you don't actually have that turned on in Eclipse, right? You see each package as it technically is seen as individual packages. I like think it's a, a display mode you can have in, 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 uh, in uh, IntelliJ as well. Yeah, but in Eclipse it's a default. It annoyed me to no end when I, when yeah, I always yeah, had to switch yeah. uh, when I started a new Eclipse instance. So because yeah. we think of packages basic, because that's the way they look, right? In the IDE, they look like folders. So we think of them as folders. So we think of subfolders, and then we think of sub think of sub packages, and they just don't exist. And uh, yeah, yeah. Torio just wrote ah, in chat yeah. a concept yeah. of child yeah. packages. Yeah, there's no sub relationship, like the real sub right. relationship. Because people sometimes ask me that. Uh, can I export all sub packages, right? Is there something like export org sales point framework dot star and then i always have to tell them there are no sub packages this is not a thing that exists the jvm just sees these are two packages yeah. and yes they might have the common prefix but that's up to you what you make out of that yeah. and yeah. Uh, so that's really interesting that there's this, this this slight mismatch and then because then you fall into that trap because i remember very vividly at some point how i started to google like how can i make stuff visible just within child packages. <laughs> and then that's when I realized like this is not a thing. And um, yeah. that's what Tori wrote. A concept of child packages would help with modularity, which is also what yeah. you said earlier. I mean, you would like to have a top level package and go from there. Yeah, I, um, there's, there's two, two things, uh, two thoughts I had to that. Like one is that uh, we have spring stuff and hibernate stuff in here. Why do you have that in the same package? Um, the reason, the, the answer I give here is because if I elevate them, those things into separate packages, they become part of the API, which I don't want them to be. I want to hide that I'm using Hibernate. I want to use uh, to hide that I'm using Spring within the package. So it's kind of like that's on purpose. So not making this thing a uh, like a first class concept in the package structure. Right. So because it's yeah. implementation detail. Um, the other uh, thing being, um, when it you can you can argue this is reasonably simply or simple that you can get that you can end up with like five to ten classes in a package, so that you can actually kind of um, digest that. In larger applications, I definitely see that you might want to give let's say the catalog thing or the order thing a bit more structure, and you would want to just for maybe also encapsulation reasons or um, uh, yeah, organizational reasons you would want to introduce sub-packages. Um, then the entire idea of package-protected um, code falls apart a bit because you might need to make types public so that they can be seen from, let's say, the order package or something like that, right? Like from yeah. sub-packages. So um, what I've also used here, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, is um, I'm using a, a tiny boot, Spring Boot extension that I'm working on called Modulus. That's sort of like working with the assumption of an, a top-level package structure like that, but then basically treats the, the, the packages like that, that we look at here as quote-unquote API packages. And allows you to have sub packages and then there's a tiny bit of code that you can execute to verify that that let's say code in the payment package does not reach out into a sub package of order for example um, yeah that's what you would argue was you would use arc unit for as well right or you could use arc unit exactly um, I, mean, the way, I think it was i think it was good good morning i think he told me that at last year's java land was it him 
that he worked on a, a, on a Java compiler plugin that you would read such a file and, and yeah, basically you compile it. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's so interesting we, too. Because at compile time you get like, oh, yeah, sorry, violating yeah. my structure here. Yeah. He's, he's tackling it similar to, to, uh, to uh, territorial here. Uh, his approach is based on a, like a JSON description file and um, like Java, I think it was Java compiler, APT, an APT implementation, I think, which works because he has that kind of description within the JSON file. So he can basically, for every class that's compiled, he can check whether that matches the verification. Um, Modulus is slightly built in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. It's kind of like trying to avoid you having to describe that additional uh, that, okay. that structure yep. additionally. And that kind of makes it hard to implement as a compiler plugin because um, the APT all, only sees like a single class at a time. And I would have to sort of get a callback once like all classes are compiled and then I see the package structure and then can work with that. But, um, the gist of it, I don't want to go in too much detail with that, is that there is some kind of convention, again, implemented based on ArcUnit um, that allows you to sort of, again, create some kind of uh, additional encapsulation that's kind of exceeding the stuff that the compiler would, would actually change for you just oh. by assuming that this is that, that would be the, the package arrangement that we that we actually um, uh, that we actually uh, kind of find think is a, a decent a decent starting point you can you can tweak the the, the allowed dependency using annotations on the package info that you should actually can you open up a, a, a one of the packages and the package info let's say on order or something like that yeah you see there's a um, there is this add module annotation um, that also uh, it, it takes um, I mean that's just it's an optional one like by default we just recognize that the package structure as is uh, there's you can you can add like human readable description names uh, which then there's another part of this module thing that would actually generate um, documentation uh, package diagrams or um, component diagrams from that arrangement and basically allow you to in, to to create documentation from your living code base without actually having to describe a whole lot of structure in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, that's, that's, that's nice, nice wrap up as well because this is basically, we start with the module system and what, how the discussion started and what you didn't, didn't like so much about, about that it basically, specifically because it's called the module system, it gives you the impression yeah. that modules are on the level of jars. And I think we can agree that yeah. the tools it gives you to lock to give you a lock on jars basically so what i used to say is that what i tend to say is about the module system that um, oh by the way i opened this but i didn't show it to anybody uh so we talked about this annotation here um yeah so what i what i tend to say is that um we think about cl methods classes jars pa sorry methods classes packages jars in certain ways like um they have dependencies they have apis they have names most of all they have names and then they have dependencies and then they also have apis right that's what we think like a method has a name yeah. has dependencies and other methods all the and then and then within that spectrum the jvm sees things as we do unless uh, but not on the jar level on the jar level it basically says like Screw you! You're on your own here. <laughs> I don't care yeah. about jar names. I don't care about anything. And what I tend, what I feel is like the model system gives you a very important, like it basically fixes a hole in that, in that um, otherwise shared understanding by giving modules or jars just that. Giving, I see it's a strength that it gives this to jars because it says, well, now jars do also have a name and they also have dependencies and yeah. they also have APIs that are that are shared. But I think what yeah. what your most what your most critical point is that it gives people the impression that if I use if I want to be modular I have to use jars as modules and that drives them off the road essentially instead of saying um, look look you got to call it call it I don't know safe jars whatever <laughs> go yeah. with that and leave the leave the term modules for something like what you do here which basically allows you well it's, it's a very simple starting point but basically gives you the point to, to, to declare modules on a lower level or wherever you feel they're fit, right? Yeah, I mean, we got the feedback that like, like module is reusing the term module might be a bit misleading. I just, um, I, uh, I just don't, on the other hand, I just don't want to, uh, be, just because that very term exists in JPMS world, right? But just I, anywhere, just it exists, just, it exists. Yeah, Maven, that's, that's, Maven that's calls these modules and IntelliJ yeah. calls these modules, everybody calls that thing modules, so go ahead. <laughs> um, 
the, the one reason that you, you mentioned like that, that runtime verification of the modularity, I've, I, I've, I, I like that quite a bit. Um, I also like know from the OSGI days, and like, the Spring team has a bit of history with that, um, I also know that it's been quite, a, or could have been a, a very a pain in the ass in terms of like, like reveal, like, okay, modules not working together at one time for some reason, because someone attempted to reflectively invoke something that wasn't allowed or what have you. I like working on modules, I can, kind of came to the, the conclusion that if there, there is a test that verifies the, mod, the modular structure of my application, and that test is actually successful during the test run. In other words, while in my CI build, just before I compose the application, so it basically sees the same class path, how much value is there in still revalidating all of this at actual runtime? Because if, if, I, if I know, like, I didn't make any mistakes in terms of like my, my intended structure, then let's say I introduce a cyclic dependency, right? A compiler would not, would not catch that. Uh, there is API in modules that you can basically use and say, here is org sales point framework, here's the package, verify the modularity, which then would, add in, the, in the very default case, it would basically say no cyclic dependencies on, on the module level. Uh, Plus, you can in add module you can define explicitly um, allowed dependencies. Right? If, if I now stated that order there is an um, allowed dependencies, right? You you can put them there if you want to, um, but and if you state them, it would be basically checked that like this module only depends on this the explicitly configured other modules. But by default, S simplicity is the only is the only thing we check for. No matter the, the details of the actual checks, we get to a state where we have a test case, we have a build step, basically, that verifies that we satisfy the structure that, however detailed we want to describe them or define it, is met. Then is it really a problem that at runtime, it's just a bloody class path and um, everything <laughs> is... That well, was kind of the... Yeah, no, I, I get. I think there's different threat levels here, right? So um, if you're using that within, within a particular application or within a library, then you're mostly using this to make sure you yourself don't make mistakes. Um, but if you ship code, for example, as a library developer to the outside world, then you also want to hope. Because what I've seen, by the way, oh, yeah. is people okay, is point. people having um, like they need some Spring API. And it's there, but it's package visible, but the class isn't final. No problem. I'm just going to extend that non-final class with a split package, going to make everything public, and there you yeah. go, fix that. So yeah. stuff like that is still possible, right? And of course, like if you go that aggressive at it, if you, I would guess if you would get a, a, get a GitHub issue where somebody says, the last spring update broke my code because I did this, you're probably yeah, like, yeah, yeah well, <laughs> that's, that's mostly on yeah. you, though. <laughs> I, I totally, and that's actually, again, a great, a great point and a great showcase, I think, to both Dalibor's point, saying, I can totally see that you want to shield the JDK against stuff like that, right? I mean, how many people are unsafe, right? Just think about I'm yeah. not getting into, into that. But uh, you, people using code that wasn't intended for, for, for public usage, by all these kinds of tricks. And I think it, um, to a sentiment of, okay, we prevent a lot of misuse and bugs with that and problems, fine. When I'm governing my application modularity and I have to start to think about, okay, there might be a developer on my team that basically uses some reflection hackery to get into basically yeah, across the arc, true. then that's not a problem I want to solve at this point anymore because no, if I have to solve- Not the reflection part. I have a I have a different problem, right? I have a, a, like a but what about a library developer? First and foremost, you're a developer I, I framework, I, I, and you have I, tons I, of I, users. I, don't don't they have the same shortcoming? Those users, like like this, like the, don't you have your own Sun Miscan save? Um, the problem being, um, there is code that we problem that we hope nobody externally uses it, um, but effectively we accept to some degree that at least. All types that are public um, might have might be in use by someone 
in this world, right? Um, that's the kind of thing. Um, and you might be right, you're right, that um, JPMS would help us to kind of like, again, put structure and encapsulation on that, right? Be explicit about this thing. On the other hand, we then have, again, to sort of arrange our packages that way. And there's no way we can rearrange any kind of Spring packages anymore, right? Because they're set in stone, because that would cause much bigger disruption um, uh, even. And the other thing being that we have, there is, uh, and that's probably a good segue to get into the final thing I wanted to discuss, is that there might be code in in Spring Framework that is supposed to be used by other Spring projects, but not by user API. And um, I know that you, I'm not sure whether it was reflection only, but can you also export to certain to a certain module? Does yeah, you can export work? and open to specific modules. Okay, yeah. so you could, you could um, export, let's say, types to um, a particular module, but I've always been at odds with that feature because that kind of assumes that Spring Framework knows about the modules that that um, want to want or are allowed to to use that package in the first place. So it's kind of like creating that bidirectional relationship that we want to avoid, like knowledge relationship, basically, right? And yeah. um, the, the the other bit, and that's some I have, which I have an example in here, is that. Um, or you could argue, okay, what if JPMS allowed me to define two different or a multiple APIs into the module? So um, it's 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 kind of assuming that a jar again has a single set of types packages that are considered the jar's public API slash interface. Right? Yeah. But very often I find myself in an arrangement and the uh, inventory package here being like one of them, uh, that when I, when I build a, a module like, or a, a component, uh, is it? Yeah. Um, when I build a component, there's usually, let's say, the API for that component that's supposed to be used by a user of the component. Well, like in this case, it's about um, like managing the amount, the, the stock, that we have that we maintain for certain for certain products, right? And but in this case, that component also has an SPI or basically a plugin API that is uh, the line item filter over there. We don't have to go into the domain details of that, but it's basically um, in 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 that scenario here. It's the the students, the end user application defining for which products we want to do certain things. So it's kind of like it's customizing the component, right? Yeah. And that's that's compl completely different code. Uh, just assume like Eclipse APIs, right? You have your APIs, um, like the, the, the RCP project, and then you have these plugins where you can customize additional things. Yes, yeah. Um, so you end up with a component that has two different sets of an API or an SPI. And that's, again, not really possible with, with, with JPMS. Because if, if that was possible, we could, let's say, um, at least we, we couldn't control whether someone would use that, but we could actually have two different sets, let's say, and say, OK, this is a set of, of types that are used or are supposed to be user consumed. And this is the set of APIs that's used to, let's say, extend a certain feature in Spring transaction facilities or what have you. And like the clients being able to explicitly refer to that single interface. You can mimic that kind of scenario with, again, an additional jar, right? <laughs> um, and it's actually what, what I've done in, in, in previous, like also pre-JDK9 uh, projects, even before my time at SpringSource, um, at a large German bank in Stuttgart, uh, we built a kind of like uh, risk management system. And we ended up with like, let's say, 30 to 40 jars because like every component basically consisted of uh, three jars: API, SPI, and implementation. Yeah, we have that. We have that in the application as well. We have an API, and then we have different kinds of of, of in, in, in corp, like yeah. Right. So that's different. that's kind of that's kind of a, a thing I'm, I'm kind of missing or have been missing in, in JPMS as well. And I I didn't really find it. Um, I mean, there there is some some conceptual complexity in here because like why where. where 
Now you can basically just say, I depend or I require that logical module name, right? Whereas if you had multiple, let's say, interfaces into that module, then you'd sort of have to qualify that, but that's probably a, a way to actually make that work. And but I mean, but I can't speak to the general case, but if you talk about SPIs, which already has the uh, as a service, right? Uh, yeah. Like this, no, like, I guess, right yeah, yeah, I guess that this is a simple use case here, but the services will fix this fine, right? Like you can have. Well, um, I'm, I'm not actually like like services is more about like uh, runtime instances, isn't it? It I'm I'm kind of I'm just also thinking, about the version of control. You can you can say uh, in this case you would say like I, I export line I like I, I you say this so this package would say so yeah this. So this like, job would say, I use line item filter, and then somebody who wants to provide line item filter just goes with, uh, provides line item filter with implementation, and then the model system will put them together. But this is basically just like Java 6 services, right? The model system didn't but, add anything, it just included yeah, the feature. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, what I'm imagining, let's say inventory was a, was a jar, a JPMS jar. Right? What I would yeah. like to express is there, that there is the concept of API, and that includes like two or three or four types, but not line item filter, because I don't actually want like client code of the model to actually know about uh, okay, yeah, the don't part. On the other hand, I want to declare line item filter plus, let's say, two other types to actually form an SPI. So for someone who wants to extend the thing to provide implementation, and I want them to be able to express I depend on that SPI, but not on the API. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, and, that might be yeah, a, as a, I said earlier, you can more you... exotic, uh, more exotic um, feature, but um, it's it's something that I've it's it's not as exotic as that I've not seen it in in production quite a bit, right? In, in real world yeah. projects, and, and as you say, like if that, you want to. Pull, pull this off like like literally like I said like this should not be exposed in that way then then the only way to do this is with additional jars right and then you yeah, also yeah, would yeah. have and then also that would mean that this jar here like this jar minus the line item filter service uh, right because that service and somebody something else they they leave this package now this 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 pres yeah. what we presume would be a jar that would most likely still have to hook into some internals here maybe so that would then mean that we would have to expose like these two jars have a very intimate relationship so we most likely have to expose one jar's content just to the other jar just for that use case which gives you gives us yeah. back to the point that you said you would prefer not uh to basically have the psychological dependency where you say uh the dependencies goes downward like this a uses b but b knows that it's used by a it wants to expose some additional api so it says exports this package mm -hmm. to a and you said that it annoys you that you go in circles there yeah and I, I, yeah. I get that as well like but like for example what that also leads to it leads to actual compiler warnings because well you still have to compile b before a right and yeah. if you compile b you get a compiler warning that it doesn't see module a on the module path it just says like dude what just just saying the module you're exporting to, no idea what that is. And okay, the only way you can okay, fix yeah. this is having multi-module compilation, which doesn't go well with, with build tools. Um, so I get that. But then the other point that I still have, I think that's the mm -hmm. valuable part there. It should be in in control of the module owning the API, who uses it. And if I have to name that bastard specifically, then that's just one thing I have to do. Although... Yeah. There's a way around that uh, with the method lookups, right? So you can, like, and that's also a very cool thing that I like, uh, would, would also start with Java 9, is mostly unrelated to the module system, that you can hand around lookups. Um, so for those of you who don't know, if you have, normally you can just use reflection for whatever. But what you can do is you can create a lookup object. It's just in, like, if, the, if that part works, let's just look it up. It's a lookup here. And you can create a lookup and then that lookup captures basically the accessibility rules of the class that created it. So that means if you're inside a module, then if you create that lookup instance, that means that lookup instance captures, I can see all the things in this module, right? I can see um, whether it's exported or not, I have, I have captured that. And then you can hand that off to somebody else. And what I like about that is that that gives reflection a more explicit a more explicit path you basically yeah. if you want to use the lookup api you have to create at some point somewhere you have to create that lookup instance and give mm -hmm. it to spring or to hibernate and by doing that 
you have, first of all, you have an API that actually tells you in code, hey, I'm using reflection. See, because I need that lookup object, you have to actually do a little bit of work to give me that. And if yeah. I have it, I can then, uh, well, Spring has it, it can, 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 you know, can use reflection, but also it can hand it off. So that would mean if you really like want to have this team of modules, but you don't want to name all of them in a cross-reference scheme, which I guess like a, like a, a quadratic explosion there, I guess you could build one reflection target. Well, not, it's, but it's not about reflections. We talk about compilation, right? So that, that everything what I just said falls apart here because this is just reflection. Damn it! Uh, so if, you, if it's about reflection, what you could then do, you hand it off to that one module. And it just passes it to all the other spring models, and they can then use reflection. But yeah, we yeah. talked about compilation mostly. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, just to circle back on on that, like two named named interfaces. That's the that's the the, the term I actually borrowed from uh, the tool called Sonar Graph, um, which is an architectural rule verification uh, tool from a German company here. Uh, they had this, this concept, is, or that's at least where I, where I encountered this in the first place. And Modulit actually supports you to just annotate types and say at named interface and then give them, whenever you give them the same name, they're basically grouped into, into buckets. Um, and then you can, let's say, from order, you could, could, argue, could basically say additional, um, you could argue. Uh, where is it though? Where's the Modulit annotation? Uh, oh, no, no, name, at, at named interface. At named interface. That's the annotation. That's the or, annotation. Yeah, I'm still looking for a better name. Uh, I don't seem to find it. Is it here? No, no, it's, it's not in the project. It's in the in the in the modulus jar. So it's part of the modulus jar. Okay, modulus. but it's not used in the project, right? No, it's not. It's not part. It's not used there. Uh, because okay. I, yeah. I actually didn't want to go that far, but it actually it, it fundamentally supports that kind of concept. And uh, to be like to be more specific about it, but uh, again, this is, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, or like it's very yeah. advanced. So. Okay. Already. Um, yeah, we've, yeah, we've been going for two hours, right? Uh, we yeah, should. Yeah, it's, it's been quite right, but I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, me too. Are there any any? So I think like so. First of all, I. I almost caught up. I saw that uh, Godoria and Troy, you had a discussion in chat. So if anybody else has a question, I think we can have one or two more, preferably short ones, maybe something not technical. We'll see uh, at some, at some, you know, we can, we could try to appear human. I uh, heard it helps on social media. I don't know. <laughs> actually, actually I, I think we, we turned this discussion into quite an interaction like with this, with these two hours. Um, and I, I hope that, um, it took a lot of the heat out of the, or the perceived heat. I never really, like, yeah, said it of my telephone and I was like, Nikolai is raw, right? Um, <laughs> not at all. And, um, maybe I actually we can, we can uh, channel a bit of that feedback into the, into the uh, appropriate channels at the JPMS team because um, I, I would like to, let's say, quote unquote, JPMS be a less disturbing factor in that kind of arrangement right um and um, be able to actually make use of it um so yeah yeah but uh, what what you should do though uh and as i said i already started with that so i can show you a quick thing that i did uh so what i i need you de i need dependencies right uh, to work on with the module system so my go-to is to add the copy dependencies a step in maven Mm -hmm. uh, when I run that, then all the dependencies add up in here, but IntelliJ didn't notice yet. So I can show you here. Uh, that's empty now, so that's not good. Uh, Maven dependencies, copy dependencies. That should work, hopefully. Okay, right, so now we have all the depend. No, we don't. Where the fuck did they go? Sorry. Okay, pardon my French. Anyway, so what I was trying to say is, uh, once we've done this and have all the dependencies in one place, all right, this is the hell is it wrong now? Oh, it's build directory. Oh, damn it. It's target depths then. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, nice. Yeah, and okay. then we can start using JDEPS for this uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have some multi release jars in there. So I have to tell JDEPS which version I want to use. Oh, do we? Yes. Uh, how, how do I find out? 
I believe it complains. It complains if you don't do this. For some okay. jar, it says two versions of module Java. Oh no, that's a different error actually. I found it out later, I think. Um, okay. Because that's the thing, right? So for example, right here, uh, let's go with this though. We realize yeah. that um, two versions of the module Java annotation found in target dependency. So Java's annotation API and Jakarta annotation API, which are not exactly the same version, they're both most likely, I don't know whether they're proper modules, <laughs> I guess not. They is... So I was, I was saying, it's like I, I went through a couple of these and I found a couple with two versions and a couple with split packages. Well, I mean... So I think the module system can still um, I get. So I think what I take away from this is. Um, like your your idea of modul modularity and your understanding mm -hmm. of modularity, and I think you convinced me largely of that, is really a lot like JARS is just not the thing to talk about here in the first place. Like it may be somewhere at some point JARS factor into this, but this should be much, much later in the discussion. The first discussion should be, should start elsewhere with the domain logic and how it is yeah. structured and should not be concerned with how many source trees and how many JARS do I have. And I get that, and, and I hope to con also to. I think I didn't even have to convince you of that. I think I, we also came to the point where um, we agreed on that. But on the level of jars, however they are structured, and however we came to them, once we have those, that's where the model system can actually do some good. Uh, and I think the JDEPS analysis here uh, uh, goes into that a bit. So it, it, it's actually pretty helpful. I, I found I just found out where, where this is coming from. Um, Spring Boot, as it's like a modern application framework, right, is already on the Jakarta annotation API. And the Java Money Moneta implementation is still on Java X annotation uh, API jar. So I probably have to add an exclude to the, I mean, if you want to add the exclude to the, to the Java Money, um, to the Moneta declaration and submit that as a pull request, you've done a great service. <laughs> To the students of the technical university of Dresden. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can, yeah, I, can I know, I know, I know. But, that, but that's not, by the way, that's another thing that I'm, I'm critical about the model system for. And I think this will, this will blow up in our faces at some point. Uh, when, when you violate encapsulation, you have command line flex to work around that. If you mm -hmm. violate um, this, what they call reliable configuration, so the idea that the configuration that you compiled and launched your application with has a reasonable chance to actually sustain the application because everything is there and nothing is, du is, du is duplicated and there are no cycles and all of that. If, the, if something goes wrong there, there's just no way to make the model system accept that. So you cannot say, yes, I know that op dependency is missing. It's on purpose. Please let me launch anyhow. You can't do that at the moment. And that means every Maven POM exclude is, blowing, is going to blow up once everything is a module. And that's a serious problem that uh, I think that has to be addressed. Like there's no way, like if you say, if you keep saying, basically every exclude in a POM is not gonna work with a module system. And that will not yeah. stand. Like it's just, it's just, that's not how real life works to, to my experience. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm, I think it's slightly related, but I don't wanna drag this out any further. Um, one thing that modulus also can do is it can basically bootstrap the application with a well-defined set of the modules involved, um, which is particularly interesting for testing. So um, if you want to, let's say, only bootstrap the, the Spring Boot application and know about catalog, quote unquote, then you can actually do that. Um, and you can then define, OK, bootstrap the module with its direct dependencies or bootstrap the module with the entire subtree of dependencies. I'm not quite sure that flexibility is even a thing in, in, in the JPMS yeah. world. Um, okay, so there's no, yeah, there have been no specific questions. So I guess um, everybody's happy with the way this went. And um, so the, thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much for being here, for taking the time. Thanks for giving me the chance to elaborate on all of this. Yeah, we discussed this uh, before, the, before the stream. It's, every, it's a, like a, it's a, it's it's a time where time is limited, right? With all we're lucky enough that we can still maintain our work, but that also oh, yeah. means that with having to uh, uh, be, 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 now becoming full time parents, which is something none, no, none of us <laughs> expected to happen this suddenly, and you know, like everybody has family and now kids are at home, and so I, I appreciate it very much, very much that you took your time out of your schedule uh, to be here and discuss that with us, and I thought it was a great discussion. I learned a lot. Um, yeah. And I think so too that we can maybe feed some some of these parts back um, to, to back elsewhere to the module, to the module system team maybe. 
Yeah. And is there anything you want to plug? Like anything? Like do you have a book out that people like? There's some. Well, there's a book from O'Reilly in the back, right? You want to bring that closer to the screen? Oh or? gosh, no. That's just. I mean, it's, it's not even a book. It's just a uh, just like the cover. It's a book we wrote in 2013, I think. The Spring Data book. It's just basically the kind of the, the title cover. Um, okay, so I guess it's not that up to date anymore. Seven years later. Well, I mean, it, it, everything that's in there still works. It's just that it's not. I mean, it still features XML configuration, all these great things. That, you know from the Spring Universe. Um, one thing I might mention, I'm not sure whether I should actually do that. Um, well, I mean, it's late, right? We're, we're like just the two of us, actually. I'm actually thinking on, or... Uh, uh, the viewer count is at zero. <laughs> just say it, nobody will uh, see. It's all good. Um, I'm actually writing on a book on like all of like the stuff that we just discussed. And of course, slightly a bit, a bit more stuff though. So the modular stuff is, is a bit a part of that. Um, but it's about going to be about like modular monoliths with Spring. Um, okay. And the, the way that um, I usually approach these things, and in which I think Spring framework features help you with uh, actually implementing um, those. And modulus again, just being an example of. Of, of, of doing that, there's going to be a lot of other stuff in there. And that sounds um, pretty good. If you need a chapter of somebody saying, the well, the module system can help you too, just just let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, 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 to invite you to write the forward or something. Um, it's just, I've, I've been like secretly, like ever when I, every time I bring the tiny one to bed, I and she's like, not asleep, I'm kind of sitting and typing a bit of ASCII doctor for myself. And uh, it's kind of, it's kind of shaping up to, to actually get to something, but it's, Going, definitely going to need some time still uh, because I just write it outside my mind. Yeah, but that sounds very good because you're obviously very knowledgeable about this, not only in theory but also in practice, which is something I have to state again. I think you've seen much, sorry, many, many more applications, many with more requests. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's actually the case because like, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm working in engineering, so we're kind of paid to actually work Spring, Spring Framework or Spring Data or what have you call, uh, code, basically, or the products. But uh, from time to time, we get actually drawn into like customers, exactly uh, projects that like are usually not the smallest ones. So um, we've seen like very, very, very big applications, and also like customers like these days are running for microservices all the time and shoot themselves in, in the foot with it, uh, doing so. So this is kind of like you see a lot of different things and a lot of different. Um, yeah, problems at different scales with different approaches so that helps. I think it helps me to get a kind of an evened out kind of view of the world. But at the same time, um, I've I've heard a couple of people we we discussed about Raphael um, who uh, Winterhalter by uh, by the offer who seems to be very satisfied with what JPMS does for him in, in his project. And um, so again, right? I'm I'm happy to learn. I'm happy to learn otherwise. And, adapt my yeah. worldview uh, to that actually yeah okay so what's so, so that's a good good um maybe i should talk to him as well have someone with a positive voice here no you're oh, yeah. positive by the um, way it's a, like totally interesting thing so having over here for, yeah. for this so I'll, I'll, I'll just thank everybody by the way if you're interested in more stuff like this on on Saturday you won't see more of this, on Saturday I'll be playing Stellaris and then next week it's going to be code. If you stick around for another minute the schedule will appear somewhere here. Because I set that up today that you can actually see the schedule, isn't that cool? Uh, so all the time, thank you very much Oliver for being here. I'll just, I'll just zone you out now. <laughs> you can stick around though, so we can still have a couple words before everybody goes to bed. <laughs> see everybody around, bye! bye, -bye. Wow, hair is getting long. Damn Corona, I really need a haircut. I stream most Tuesday and Thursday, Wednesday evenings, UTC, blah.